Failure is definitely a part of success because if you are not failing every now and again, you're not pushing hard enough. Failure is becoming more mainstream, more popular, more talked about. It's trendy, it's hot. And that's why we're talking about failure in this episode of the ETH podcast. I'm Jennifer Kakshuri, and obviously, I'm not the only one who's interested in the dynamics of failure. People don't quite understand it fully. It's something that people are attracted to. People also love stories, uh, you know, success stories, failure stories. Failure turned into success stories are particularly very interesting. And I hope we don't fail at producing this episode or by saying that I'm probably uncovering uncertainty as something to be afraid of rather than seeing uncertainty as a chance to go forward. So should I hope that we fail at producing the story to somehow develop? <laughs> No, no, that sounds strange. You should rephrase that somehow. Well, you know, Tease, I want to do a good job. That's why I'm trying here. But it's not about me here. Let me introduce my guests then. Yeah, that's maybe better. We could start with the recordings. Okay. We're on. Sasha, please introduce yourself with your full name and what you do. I am Sasha, Sasha Stocker, an electrical engineering student at ETH. I am currently in my master's and I'm also the now just retired executive vice president of the ETH Entrepreneur Club. And I'm 25 years old. And already retired. Wow. <laughs> well, retired from a student organization. So hopefully that's not the end. As a member of the board of the Entrepreneur Club, Sasha was involved in organizing the so-called fuck-up nights in Switzerland. You'll hear more about those later. Manu Kapoor is also a guest in this episode of the ETH podcast. He's a professor for learning sciences and higher education at ETH. As a teenager, you dreamt of becoming a soccer pro. Instead, you're a professor at ETH. What happened? Ah, great question. Uh, a lot has happened. If during my teenage years you'd ask me, oh, you would be a professor one day, I'd just laugh at you. Uh, that was never on the cards, uh, but you know, life is what happens. And my soccer career ended because of injury. And then I had to figure out what else to do with my life, uh, including completing my studies and then picking a few jobs, including teaching. And then by some luck and chance, I ended up doing a PhD in cognition and learning. And thereafter, I've just been doing research on how people learn. Productive failure is the heart of Manu's research. He told us failure is a trend and everyone is talking about failing and not succeeding right away. Of course, there are several layers of this. Showing off failure is in a sense what the fuck-up nights are, telling a story about stumbling, falling, getting up and moving forward. How did talking about humiliation on stage in front of an audience all begin? The fuck-up nights is a global movement coming out of Mexico City, where a bunch of friends started a startup and basically they hit a rough patch, they had to close it down. And then they were really left with a lot of shame, a lot of public humiliation. And they really thought to themselves, well, everybody's encouraging to kind of be an entrepreneur, but failure is a big part of entrepreneurship. And once you kind of hit that rough patch, It's still not really culturally accepted to kind of say, yes, this is a project that didn't work out. I fucked up. I might have wasted some investor money. I might have disappointed some customers, some partners. And the fuck up nights is really about breaking that taboo, breaking that fear of failure and bringing the entrepreneurs that will all go through this, this rough patch together to talk about the things that are usually not really talked about. And I think that is the key essence of the fuck-up night. And do you recall when you first participated at a fuck-up night in the audience? Um, my first experience at the fuck-up night was one of our largest fuck-up nights in Zurich and actually, therefore, also in the world because we are, as a club, hosting the largest fuck-up nights in the world. So it was in Theater 11 with almost 1,500 people. So we were pretty much sold out. And that was just a phenomenal night with so many different stories and so many different learnings that you could take away as an audience member. Which story do you remember most vividly? Which fuck-up story? The most vivid moment for me was definitely from Edith Schmid. So 
with a lot of these these speakers that we get, especially you know when they come into the later stages of their careers, they're very comfortable about talking about when they fucked up 20 years ago. But for Edith, it was definitely something different. You know, it's actually a little bit ironic for me to be standing on the stage tonight. Edith Schmidt is the former president of the ETH Entrepreneur Club who founded a medtech startup that failed after three years. I'm fucking up. <laughs> okay, because um, originally back in 2015, um, I brought the Fuck Up Night franchise to Zurich together with the Entrepreneur Club. And I actually had to laugh thinking back because I love the concept. I love hearing other people talk about their fuck ups. I was like, why did I make it on this stage tonight? It's so weird. But... In all honesty, I think that's actually why I love the whole format, because it teaches us that fuck-ups are part of all our lives. So let me tell you my story tonight. She was just in the moment where she had to close down the company, kind of go through the rubbles of what's left over afterwards, and she still came out, she still came on stage. I was CEO of a Swiss medtech startup called Kenzen. We failed. I failed. We're in liquidation. And it's really hard to describe the feeling to someone who's never witnessed a failure like this before. It feels like the earth is falling out from under you. And one thing that was especially difficult for me during that time is I became my own worst enemy. I told myself I wasn't as strong as I thought I was that I was a loser. I told myself I'm not the fighter I thought I was. And the best part of it all was that I think around that time where she was on stage, the company was in ruins, but kind of the, the customers, the partners, the employees all said, hey, why are we kind of giving up? Why are we not doing this again? And she is actually back on her feet now, running the next project. And that is kind of what stuck with me for, for a really long time of, Capturing that essence of, yes, you, you will fail. It's most likely that you will fail. But at the end of the day, if you get up, it was not actually a failure. It was a learning. And that's kind of what she did. And so that's probably what I took away from that night. I'm currently kind of regaining my strength and rebuilding my identity. For now, I have to leave it up to you how you want to see me and what label you want to give me. But I can guarantee you one thing. The core team of Switzerland is getting back on its feet. And we will aim for that peak again. Thank you. In Manu Kapoor's research and practice of productive failure, less shame is involved than in these stories of the fuck-up nights. It's about making mistakes at the very beginning of a process. It's about deliberately, intentionally designing for failure. Uh, the idea is, if we all learn from errors and mistakes, we should not wait for it to happen. So I say, okay, let's design for failure and use that intentionally to learn more deeply. The research on productive failure started with my doctoral work at Columbia almost 20 years ago. Um, and since then, you know, there have been more than 150 experiments. And can you tell us about the research you did with students at ETH in maths? The work at ETH was a practical demonstration of how one could design for productive failure into large classes, which are typically in a traditional format of lectures and exercises. And there we implemented productive failure in a very small but surgical way uh, before key ideas and concepts in the course. Uh, we invited students to participate in these productive failure sessions on a voluntary basis. Uh, these sessions took no more than, you know, about seven hours for the whole year. You know, so it wasn't an overwhelming amount of time invested. But it was based on solid science. And that's why I say it's a practical demonstration of how you can create large learning effects. And we found that the passing rates of this course, which were historically at 55-odd percent, you know, they jumped to 65 in the first iteration and 75, and now they're hovering around 70, which is extraordinary, given overall the whole intervention only lasted seven hours spread over the year. A little intervention with a large impact. What exactly did the intervention look like? 
So we designed these problem-solving exercises based on the productive failure principles that students engage in. They try to come up with as many ideas or solutions or representations. They know that we tell them and they themselves know that they may not be able to get to the correct answer because they've not learned the concepts yet. But the idea is the more they generate ideas and solutions, the more it will prepare them. Even if those ideas are incorrect or suboptimal, the more it will prepare them to learn from the upcoming lecture that targets that concept. That's what we did, basically. So in a sense, it is struggling with practice to have an open and prepared mind for the theory that brings solutions. How did Manu come up with this idea? I taught mathematics to 12th graders for a number of years, four to five years. And, you know, even though I thought that I was teaching very well, and even my students said, yes, you're a good teacher, you, you know, you put in the effort, you engage, and still, you know, if you probe students' understanding repeatedly, you would find that the understanding was very shallow, yeah, or it would just not retained over time. The students would study for an exam, and they'd do well in the exams, and three months later, their knowledge for this one exam was completely gone. So... You know, there was something in that illusion of success as a teacher that I took on hindsight. I think I took that into my doctoral degree because I wanted to investigate how is it that a very engaging, well-structured, uh, you know, clearly explained lecture and students still do not understand things deeply. Because Manu wanted to investigate and find out why a very engaging, well-structured, clearly explained lecture still results in students not really understanding. There must be something wrong with the fundamental assumption that you must start by explaining the correct thing. Maybe we need to completely flip that assumption and say, well, that can come later on, but let's prepare the student to get him or her in a place where they're ready to understand and learn something new. And I think that pre-step is critical and failure is one of the key ingredients of designing that. Manu's idea behind his research, in a nutshell. If you don't learn to fail, you will fail to learn, as I say. I really like this. And this one sentence, if you don't learn to fail, you will fail to learn, is something that gets one thinking about the school systems, and it shifts the perception of failure. When we carry out productive failure, especially in real ecologies like classrooms and lecture halls, I think we we work on the culture, we, we set the right expectations and norms so that when students are struggling to solve a problem, they're not thinking, oh, I'm not smart enough. They're thinking, ah, I'm in the right space. This is exactly what is predicted at this point in time for me to be engaged in and I must push through this and I must persist through. Manu Kapoor sees some positive developments regarding this attitude. I think failure is becoming increasingly valorized in the general you know, uh, public and mainstream meat. Do you live near a church? Sorry for interrupting you. Yes, it is 11 <laughs> okay. o'clock, right? Yes, there you go. Yes. Do we have yeah. to wait a few minutes? We'll just wait. We'll just wait. It's just a couple of minutes. So let's go back to Sasha. He also talks about a cultural shift. Especially in Switzerland, we believe there's still a lot of cultural change that needs to happen for entrepreneurs to kind of have a better Or, or even better environment to fulfill their dreams. You know, if you look at it compared to the US, you come out of university with a couple hundred thousand dollars in debt and still these people risk it all, go for their dreams. And here in Switzerland, you graduate, you have no debt, you have a support system around you and we still don't see the amount of people saying, hey, I'm if I'm capable of accepting this good job offer from a great company, then you're probably also smart enough to start your own thing and really learn as you go, because that's what entrepreneurs do. And we really want to bring cultural change to the thinking that, you know, you have to be successful after a couple of years. If you're not able to post this, I'm super grateful to announce post on LinkedIn after a couple of months of graduating, uh, you're a failure. So that's kind of what the club wants to achieve. And The Fuck Up Nights is definitely one of our key tools to achieve that message and get it across Switzerland. And is it easy to open the door to people? Like when you call them up and say, hey, we're from The Fuck Up Night, are they open and say, yeah, we'll come on stage right away? Or do you have to convince them also? Uh, luckily, we, we don't say we're from The Fuck Up Nights, we're from ETH, I think, in Switzerland. <laughs> It's a bit of a different name. 
So that definitely helps. Funny enough, for the speakers, it's also like a way of clearing some things up, revisiting some things that you might not be able to talk about. Uh, a lot of people are very willing to share their failures because they would have wished to have access to, to that knowledge when they started out. Sasha is still a student at ETH. I haven't set out like a clear path of I'm going to go into energy science or I'm going to go into kind of the med tech space. There's so many things happening at the moment. There is a lot of fintech stuff going on in the crypto world. Uh, also, I haven't set out a clear set of like a space that I want to invent in yet. We're definitely always with a couple of friends talking about what's most exciting, what products and startups that we think are very cool, what they might be missing, where we could maybe start out exploring different ideas and implementing them. Knowing that the road will be bumpy, are you more fearless than you would have been without the knowledge of the fuck-up nights? Um, I wouldn't say more fearless. I would just say you have a better understanding that it will happen. And the best thing is to kind of, you prepare for it in, in the worst case scenarios, but at the end of the day, you can't avoid failure. You will hit something that is not going to work out. You will make some mistakes and that's okay. That's how Manu Kapoor sees it too. Failure is trendy and failure is necessary for learning, but it is not failure that you target. You know, it is trying things that are beyond your current skill sets and expertise and trying new things and having an openness to this experimentation and so on and so forth. To learn from failure in life, we need to find ourselves, not every time, but if we really want to grow for time and again, we need to put ourselves in these growth zones where we are going to struggle, where it's going to be challenging and then have the knowledge that, well, research backs it up. So it's not just, you know, It's a it's a great idea. It's a trending idea, jumping on the bandwagon. But 20 years on, we understand why it works and how it works. So we just need to be in that zone. And failure would automatically happen. And then you must have the confidence as you go through multiple times that this is how you grow. Manu's growth zone is at home with his toddler. I have an 18-month-old and I fail every day. <laughs> trying to figure out what exactly he wants uh, or what he's trying to communicate. So we are in that zone where you know, he's babbling and learning to speak and it's just, uh, you know, we have to go through a lot just to figure out, oh, okay, that's what you want. Oh, okay, that's what you don't want, you know. So that's my life right now. <laughs> I can relate to that. And it's comforting to think failing with my kids doesn't have to be so bad for them and for me. Really? Is this your last sentence in the story about your family? Well, isn't a family like a little enterprise? Like a, we're all entrepreneurs with our kids. You should know too. But um, okay, we can, we can uh, use a quote from Sasha for the ending about entrepreneurship. There will definitely be some things that you will miss, things that will not implement correctly, and therefore you will fuck up, you will fail. And... It's an iterative process that will sometimes hit you in a dead-end road and you have to kind of figure out a way to get back on the road that's leading you to the proper exit. Yes, that's the proper exit for the story. This is the ETH Podcast and I'm Jennifer Kakshuri and I produce this podcast together with Thies Wachter and Luki Fritz from the Audiobande. If you like our podcast, recommend it to your friends and share it on social media. Thanks for joining us. Mm -hmm.